Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan N. S. Pierce, and my esteemed guest, Dr. Aaron Adair. Uh, you all know Aaron from, um, it sounds like a Simpsons episode, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, um, you will know Aaron uh, from previous videos with me. And also he has, oh, have I got it here? Please, do I have it here? Yes, I do. And he has written this marvellous book, The Star of Bethlehem, A Skeptical View. Um, oh, you don't want that book. You want this book. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, 15 copies of each. Um, so... Uh, Aaron, would you like to just uh, remind viewers quickly of, of kind of what you do, what expertise you have, so on and so forth? All right. Yeah. So uh, my training has been in physics, especially related to education research, earned my PhD from The Ohio State University close to 10 years ago now. Uh, research affiliateship with MIT, where I continue that research. Uh, my day job is a data scientist and I moonlight as a uh, historian and uh, biblical scholar. I mean, what a smorgasbord of delights that is. <laughs> um, so what, what's interesting with, with your expertise and, and what you've learned is that you're not just a scientist, but you're an uh, kind of science educator or history of science education. That's your bag. Is, is that correct? Right, right. Yeah. So like specifically my uh, thesis work that I've been continuing since then has been uh, like the nature of intuitions when it comes to physics and the fact that people's intuitions doesn't match what we try to teach them. So what methods do we actually use to actually make sure that when students leave the classroom, they don't just like take all this uh, information about Isaac Newton, just kick it to the side and go back and think like they're medievalists again. Uh, how do we actually change those underlying intuitions? Because uh, they're pretty strong uh, and they're not even religiously motivated. It's just how people think the world works. It just happens to be incorrect. <laughs> Which is interesting because that's going to link into something we will be talking about, which is um, critical thinking. And, uh, you know, connected to that are the things that get in the way of critical thinking, which are your cognitive biases. Um, I remember uh, editing a book some time back called 13 Reasons to Doubt. Uh, and one of the chapters in here was by Dr. Caleb Lack, who wrote a really good chapter on cognitive biases mm. uh, and basically about how you know, here's a bunch of the most famous ones. Here's how problematic they are. And there's not a lot you can do about them, really. Like, we've all got them. But actually, the best thing you can do about them is to know about them so that you are aware if you are doing them so that you can then mitigate against them. But it's really difficult because actually we are all um, victim to, to those biases. Would, the, would, would that be broadly something you'd agree with? I think so, yeah. Though uh, even knowing you have the bias, it's still very difficult to actually stop yourself and do the metacognitive work to stop yourself and say, hey, which bias is going on here? Like which uh, cognitive error am I making? On the other hand, people are then very good to say, oh, I know this list of cognitive biases and I see you doing all yeah, this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that's really good. I mean, you know, we're going to talk about atheism and science and the interaction thereof, but there, there, there's something to be said for atheists do that an awful lot. You you get the fallacy fallacy of throwing around, oh, you're, you're using that fallacy, you're using that fallacy in the absence sometimes of actually providing a substantive argument yourself, but also the idea like you, you've got that bias and you've got that bias. I mean, I do this, I do this, but yeah. but I, I like to think that I'm somewhat aware of my own deficiencies, but, but, um, you know, you're, you're right. You know, that's such a common uh, trope, isn't it? Just to, uh, attacking the your interlocutor uh, for, for having X, Y and Z sort of biases uh, as if you, you, you know, magically don't have them. Yeah, yeah. It actually reminds me of a webcomic from I don't even know how many years ago, but a person who had like mastered knowledge of all fallacies and like which is, you know, shouting is like that fallacy, that fallacy. Then they're in a debate. A uh, person gives some presentation about why they should go with completely uh, laissez-faire capitalism, the person, you know, just shouts fallacy, 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 then the person goes, drinks a sip, fallacy, fallacy, and the person's just doomed. <laughs> yep, yep, there you go, um, just head explodes. Uh, so um, we have uh, Mr. Willis here saying, uh, Aaron, have you thought about diversifying? I don't know if that's away from sort of the Star of Bethlehem or, or just in general, but I think that the wonder of, of, Aaron is that 
his expertise can be applied to lots of different areas. And of course, being interested in biblical exegesis as you are and stuff like that and the history of like, astronomy and astrology in the ancient Near East and all these kind of things, you've got, you, you've got a variety of expertise and, and potentially you could put your fingers in many pies. Would that, would that be fair? I do think, yeah, I have uh, fingers in quite a few pies since I'm doing, you know, uh, science research, education research, um, this history stuff. Uh, if anything, I've also like by digging deeper into the, some of these subjects, it requires me to learn about a broader swath of history, like um, my efforts to try to extend my research into people talking about the Star of Bethlehem makes it realize, OK, now I have to basically learn about like the history of the university in early modern Germany. Uh, or uh, about the propaganda of uh, King Charles I and II of England, things like that. Um, on the other hand, uh, another way I'm just interpreting his uh, statement, if he's looking for diversity in his portfolio, um, I do recommend going with ETFs, trying to match the broad stock market. I think that's a good way to uh, 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 minimize risk the best you can, because picking stocks is very hard. There you go. Uh, it turns out it's been sarcastic uh, and actually fully, <laughs> fully aware of your wide variety of skills. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so what we're going to talk about uh, today, and we'll, we will be talking in uh, my lovely British accent and your beautiful American accent, uh, as uh, Richard Williams uh, observes, uh, we're going to be talking about science and how that interacts with atheism and atheists. So let's just first talk about science. Well, what is science? So tell, give us a definition of science. And by the way, this needs to be, or I, I want it to be a Q&A style um, event and one that we can put on, you know, not irregularly. Uh, so if you do have any super chats, if you've got any questions, please get them in and get the get the chat going um, for those of you who are there. Uh, so Aaron, what, how, how would you, what, what would you describe science uh, or how would you define science? So it is kind of a combination of things that is the combination of the things that we know and the methodology that we use to go about finding it. So let me just give an example of the thing that's right behind me right here. Uh, this image of a, the, event, or the accretion disk around the event horizon of a black hole. Uh, and this is actually an updated version of the image that first came out several years ago because it includes, I keep pointing on the wrong side, uh, need to reverse my brain here. These striations you can see here, this is in addition to what was from the first photo uh, with better um, algorithms, they were able to see these little striations due to the magnetic and electric field of the black hole and the material around it. And this is from a galaxy, this is from a black hole in a galaxy, I forget how many millions of light years away. Far, Just, far you know, away. this incredible object, exactly, yes. <laughs> but how do we take this image? How do we interpret it? Uh, how do we go about that process of coming up with ideas and trying to see what are the implications and going out and trying to find evidence for and against it? And I think the most important thing about science is the effort to actually go and try to find evidence against the hypothesis. It's too easy to find things favorable to your thesis. Uh, if, if that's the way we were still always doing science, we would not have advanced. It's the fact that we actually go out and say, this is the part that doesn't make sense. Here's the thing that doesn't fit with the idea rather than just trying to find any way to cram a theory around the evidence rather than changing it. So is that to, to, that's to uh, sing the praises of falsification rather than just verif verification. Is that, is that it's also a fact of having a theory that is understandable enough that you can see the implications. If your hypothesis is so complex that it can conform to anything, then, uh, you don't even you can't even tell when it's false. Right. At that point, it's not even wrong. And, and is it worth pointing out the difference between science as a method and science as a body of knowledge? Because I think in common parlance, people people throw around, oh yeah, science, as in it's just it's it's the knowledge rather than science as the way that we obtain knowledge. I also <laughs> see the so ah, here we go. Well, the thing is, I also, when I realized that as much as it is a method, the fact of the matter is so much of the methodology is, you know, being done in laboratories by isolated people or groups of people. It's not something that like everyone gets to do at once, like democracy. Uh, it's not like everyone in the United States can do like the same experiment at once, or at least not in many occasions. So I also try to think to what aspect is also science 
a sociological phenomenon and how much of it is it that we have like certain mores and uh, responsibilities that go into making science possible. After all, there's nothing in the scientific method that says you must be honest, but clearly if everyone was a liar, we wouldn't really be able to make decent progress. And that's just something in our background of what we create in our society to say, we're going to privilege people who are honest. We are going to punish people who are deceptive. So, so that, in many that's ways, almost I think context, that's part of it too. That's almost contextualizing the the method itself, um, but it's also understanding that we can't all be scientists. So maybe there, there's something to be said about being someone who who defends the 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 tenets of science and that utilizes. Uh, scientific findings effectively. I mean, there's a whole kind of this yeah. kind of spreads out into having many facets. Yeah. yeah. And I see like, you know, the people who, you know, um, will often, you know, scream that from the top of their lungs, do your own research. But you find out that their research doing is basically finding the Google link that they liked and ignoring so much else. So there has to be also this larger ethos that to do science, even if you're not in the laboratory, has all these other aspects of intellectual humility and um, having a greater depth of general knowledge, as well as communicating with other people with direct knowledge of the thing you're trying to study, rather than just you know spending ten minutes on Google and find out, yep, the Earth is flat. I found this link that said so. Yeah, so so like doing science in the kind of common parlance that we're talking about about it here is almost about uh, like the the methodology we use to establish what we think of facts and try and convince someone else thereof. So it's like, yeah. you know, uh, and again, we, we circle back to, to the biases and being aware of them. And, you know, I, uh, I just think of like my own research. I I've learned over the years how to research things really, really quickly because I'm doing it so often. So I'm using, you know, Google uh, as a search engine really effectively uh, I'm also using Google Scholar and, I'm, and I know how to use these things. I know, I know what the pitfalls might be and, um, and how to use them effectively. And so therefore, if I'm presenting someone else with a bunch of, you know, hopefully persuasive scientific facts um, or arguments, I am, that's, that's a holistic, there's a holistic way of looking at that in terms of, you know, not just the, the, the sources that I'm using and the, the, the actual the methodology involved in doing the science here, but my methodology involved in picking the, 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 the sources in order to present a case, which is a scientific case for X, yeah. Y, Z. And so, you know, these things are, are different, like layers and elements that either are science or involve science on a, on a very practical basis. Yeah, yeah. And so much of it is, you know, trying to fully appreciate what might be in any given hypothesis usually requires a huge amount of research and background knowledge, even in itself, to know the implications of the idea so you actually can tell if you've actually looked into that sort of thing enough. There is usually so much depth that you could go into a subject that you might get lost in and you get lost in the weeds or because of a misunderstanding that you pull back some interpretation that someone with a uh, broader knowledge set can understand, oh, here's where you went off sideways. And so all your other conclusions are faulty. And uh, yeah, that, that's, you know, there's a reason science is hard. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, have you ever come across the, the the you know being accused of doing a argumentum ad populum, which is like, oh, just because more people believe it doesn't make it any more true. That's a fallacy. Going back to the kind of like the love of fallacies, and and yeah. when you're presenting a scientific like fact, which is often a fact because a, a, a fact because it's a consensus agreed position you know take something like climate science you say yeah. right 97 percent of scientists believe this therefore it's effectively a fact and they they say well it's just an argument and argument and mad popular I mean, you're like well actually no th you know this is and then you have to kind of unpick this and say well this is all about scientific consensus like well what do you understand the tension there and what do you have anything to say to that yeah so remember that the whole reason we have like experts and expert consensus is that is because a lot of the research that you would need to be able to do to come to some sort of conclusion is not something that you can repeat quickly, easily at home. Like, how am I going to do a random controlled uh, trial of a drug 
in my apartment with my wife and my cat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how am I going to do this with thousands of subjects over uh, months, if not years, to look for effects? I have to basically rely on what other people have done. And so the whole point of having these experts to say, not just their say so, it's they're saying this because of all this um, research and collected evidence and all the considerations of all the nuances and complexities that I can't repeat on my own, or either because I don't have the capacity, the time, the money. And as long as we have this in an environment where you have people that can uh, bring forward uh, uh, criticism to any sort of claim, uh, uh, show strengths and weaknesses of any sorts of arguments or evidence collected, and then you have that sort of adversarial going at each other, but then coming to some consensus point, that looks much more strong. I mean, compare this to, say, those sitting in uh, church pews where uh, if they aren't singing the right hymn, so to speak, they have to get out. That sort of consensus isn't trustworthy if it's basically forcing conformity versus an environment where you are encouraged, in fact, required to, you know, pick apart and argue uh, with evidence to your conclusions and try to convince your colleagues. Yeah. So, so let, let's go. Let's talk a little bit about the the method itself. What, what's involved in the method of science that that's uh, that's also makes it an, uh, a particularly strong epistemological uh, mechanism, and by that I mean epistemology is is the study of knowledge and truth, right? So it, uh, the idea that is science, like you've hinted at, has a kind of um, self correcting mechanism built into it, right? Which is is to say that, and you can talk a little, uh, you can, you can do the talking about that. So it's got a self correcting mechanism in it, in, in in a way that religious epistemology doesn't, right? So what has what has religion added to the knowledge base over the last two thousand years? Well, arguably not a lot. Uh, what has science added? A hell of a lot. So you know, and, and that's because it has a self correcting mechanism where revelation and religious epistemologies don't have a self-correcting method so can you talk a little bit about the method of science what is the method the scientific method and how does it have a self-correcting mechanism so as most people will learn that like a big part of coming to science is that you have some sort of set of observations facts background knowledge that you have and then you try to have some way of assembling it which we're calling a hypothesis but to have a good hypothesis is what does it suggest should be and should not be seen. If I have a hypothesis that everything in the world uh, is pulled by uh, gravity down with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second, except this, well, that's at least a maybe a complicated uh, theory, but at least I can go and see if it's right or wrong. And namely, I can take this item and see if it does what I expect it to. Now, obviously I didn't pull out my measurement device to make sure gravity is working in my apartment today, but for practical purposes, let's say gravity is okay uh, here in Boston. <laughs> you know, occasionally they're doing something weird at Harvard, the gravity gets a little bit messed up, but today it seems fine. <laughs> yeah. But the, yeah, but the first step is how do you try to explain what you're seeing in your previous background, knowledge, information, facts, or even well-established theories, and then if you have a clear understanding of what it entails, you can look for those things it entails to try to see, does it actually fit? Does it explain further observations? What sorts of practical implications might it have? What can you go to see if it's actually right or not right? Yeah, so um, the uh, a, a quick overview of the method, just going to the, you know, the f first place I have here is one, you ask a question. So, you know, you and, and what's great about the scientific method is straight away it's about curiosity it's about trying to find out things about what you know that you, that you don't know the answer to yet or, mm -hmm. or or you might have an inkling uh and and this is your way of finding out the answers you do some background research you construct a hypothesis you test your hypothesis by doing an experiment uh you analyze your data you draw a conclusion and then you communicate your results and then, and then, you know, if, if in testing that hypothesis, there's a feedback loop that goes on there, which is if you test your hypothesis and, and your data shows your hypothesis is wrong, you go back and look at your hypothesis and adjust accordingly. But then within this whole process of you, like, being able to test, correct your own, like, mistakes and what have you, you also have the peer review process as well. 
which is the lar largest self-correcting mechanism that, that is so often you know talked about. Right, right. Now, there is, of course, the complication that when we go and do an experiment, there's usually more than one hypothesis entailed in the experiment in any given time. So I might do an experiment and not only maybe am I testing my own theory of gravity, but I also have the theory that the electronics in my sensors are working. Uh, sometimes it's you know straightforward like that. Um, sometimes it's much more difficult to see what might be the other hidden premises in any experiment you do. So um, I, is this Durkheim and who else? I'm trying to remember the uh, two philosophers' name attached to the idea that when you're testing a hypothesis, you're actually testing multiple hypotheses at once. So it's usually very hard to just like do one test and say, all right, that completely disproved my theory. It, it, there's all these other ancillary uh, things that could also be going wrong. So that's why it often needs to be not just one crucial experiment, but usually a collection of different disparate experiments to try to test um, those different hypotheses separately. Is it my machine that's breaking today? Well, let's test it with somebody else's. Is it my method? Let's try with a different method measuring the same sort of thing. So when you teach science at schools, we, we talk, uh, I, I don't know the same in America, but in Britain, it's about fair testing. So you say, right, it's a fair test, which means you have to only change only one variable. And if you change only one variable, then 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 you can properly test, you know, whether, you know, what is having causal efficacy here. Uh, but then, of course, you know, if, if the machine, if, if something's gone wrong and you've only tested one variable or something kind of, you know, you look at look at where they found the got the, they had that thing in CERN some years back and people like William Lane Craig were going a bit crazy and everyone's saying, <laughs> OK, right. If these results are true, then, yeah, this kind of screws everything up. But there might be something else going on here, which is there was a there was a problem with the experiment or you know, right, some right. machinery. Um, and, and to give further background, so this was the Opera experiment, which is an extension of CERN. Um, and what they do is they produce a beam of neutrinos and they send it literally through the crust of the Earth to a sensor in Italy. I forget which town in Italy, but they um, literally shoot this beam through the Earth to pick up the neutrinos there and they thought that the neutrinos were coming in, or at least their measurements were indicating those neutrinos were getting there at a rate faster than the speed of light. Now, of course, everyone's thinking like, but Einstein said no. So is Einstein wrong? Is there something wrong with the experiment? The people who ran the experiment basically sat on these results for months and months, like trying to figure out, you know, it's like, it's much more likely something's wrong with their equipment than Einstein is wrong. But even after like um, all the work they could, they couldn't figure out why they were getting this anomaly. And it was like really solid. It was statistically significant. Um, they couldn't uh, figure it out. So they finally released the results and said, here's what we're finding. Uh, we don't know why uh, do the other theorists and other people out there in the community have any ideas what's going on. Uh, theorists came out with ideas. They said, no, we already looked at that. Other things came up, we looked at that. Finally, after a lot of haranguing uh, uh, going through, they found the result ultimately was a loose cable, which added about a couple of nanoseconds of delay into the signal, which was enough to account for the result. And once that was fixed, the neutrinos weren't going faster than light anymore. And there you go, loose cable. Who knew? Yep. Like They just needed to turn it off and on again. Uh, but, <laughs> but you had people like William Lane Craig, you know, t you know talking about, you know, much higher ideals than just a yes. loose cable. And, and yeah. Know. Oh, it's actually quite funny because what he did, he's accidentally um, disproved himself. So the reason he got all excited about these faster than light neutrinos is because he subscribes to a different theory of time than what is the standard theory amongst most physicists if they know theories of time, the one most consistent with special relativity. Uh, so in his version of the A theory of time, uh, the, called the neo Lorentzian theory, it does allow for like faster than light particles. They just can't start from below the speed of light and then go faster than light. They had to have started faster than light and then they could stay there. So he was looking at this and saying, hey, this might be evidence of the A theory of time. Now that evidence disappeared, but conversely, it means we've never found any evidence of faster than light particles, no matter when we've looked, even when we thought we did and we looked really hard for them and we couldn't find that. Therefore, that should be empirical evidence against it. So it's not just metaphysical uh, niceties. It's just not um, what he argues is better. Literally, that's what the evidence shows. It's more consistent with the beer theory of time. So what Craig accidentally did was show there is an empirical difference between the two theories, and only one of them is consistent with all the evidence right now. Yeah, what? and uh, and this is uh, something I talk a lot about. I keep I love a good book spanning session. But um, uh, did God create the universe from nothing? Uh, countering William Lane Craig's Kalan cosmological argument, and what he does is you mentioned the, the Neo Lorentzian um, interpretation or, or understanding uh, involving time. 
and he cherry picks his science. I mean, he, he's good at that. He cherry picks his science. And in that case, he, he takes a fringe belief that really no one adheres to in the scientific community. Yeah, yeah he and found he, like the five physicists in the world that um, take a different view. And basically, he had to like have a couple different books devoted completely to finding some other interpretation of time uh, that's not consistent with general relativity. Yeah, and that he he used that to then, you know, uh, uh, underwrite his his whole idea of how the universe had to have a beginning and et cetera, et cetera. And there's some absolute time frame out there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's all it gets quite involved with you know understanding, as you mentioned, of the A theory of time and the B theory of time. But you know that that's wrapped up in he. You know, these are the things. So when he presents in debate, as he particularly used to, he used to trot out the Kalam quite a lot. Uh, and he'd go, blah, 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 blah. And everyone says, oh, that sounds really reasonable. But of course, when you start unpicking what his premises are based on, and you think, well, that's a dodgy bit of science, and that's a dodgy bit of philosophy, and that's a dodgy bit, then you're like, okay, this this argument falls to pieces. But the way he presents it, of course, is it seems very, very logical and, and sound and valid, uh, but it but it but it is not. Um, sorry, you're you going to say something. Um, I was going to say that in some ways, though, this is also somewhat similar to other people who will um, say that they have scientific evidence or scientific proof for uh, all sorts of things that end up not being true. So it has like the trappings of science. It's not even necessarily pseudoscience, though sometimes it is. But the only way like the audience might be able to see through it is they already have to have like this detailed uh, background knowledge. So like if Craig is going off about uh, everything that begins to exist has to have a cause, you have to realize, OK, he is also coming from a particular metaphysical background about a theory of time that is currently not consistent with what most physicists would say. That is some heavy lifting you had to have done before you even sat in that chair to hear that lecture. And, yeah. and that's one of the things that, you know, makes doing science and philosophy more generally very difficult. You have to basically, you know, to be part of the conversation, you've already had to have basically been reading the last 3000 years of that conversation. I, I, and when I, when I give talks, I mean, I don't do it so much anymore because of my some multiple sclerosis and whatnot. And the fact that we've had a pandemic for two years, uh, but but generally, when I go and give a talk on a, any given subject as a philosopher, uh, but also in terms of biblical exegesis, uh, may, maybe it's on the resurrection or whatever, I find I have to know about so many different subjects really well enough. Because when you present something, and the fact that everything is interconnected anyway, uh, so you're talking about whether God exists, and then you're talking about what, what your theories of time, what how, how well do you know quantum, how much do you know cosmology, you know, and then it's like, well, then you've got the moral argument, then you're talking about psychology, and, and you know, why do people believe all that psychology, so I need to know about psychology of religion, how the mind works, you know, and it turns out that you have to know an awful lot about an awful lot. And uh, and luckily, when my brain was 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 really in a, in a good place, like five years ago, I was really good at, at doing that, and I could I could present on any subject and dip into all these other subjects, and it was just like. But I felt I, I really had to have that kind of knowledge base, it, it, you know, and that's why I admire someone like Craig, although he cherry picks his stuff really problematically. He does have a wide knowledge base and, and he's able to pull on that. Or he certainly used to be very efficiently in debate. And so that was what made him a master, mm -hmm. you know, orator. Um, but there you go. But, you know, if, if you're cherry picking your science and I, and, I, and that's a real problem, you know, with particularly with uh, religious apologists uh, is, is, you know, that, that, confirmation bias would you like to explain confirmation bias and how it can affect how we do science yeah i'll try to do my best there so when we are going about the world we seem to have basically built-in filters to block out the things that are not quite consistent with how we see things we're particularly good at remembering the times that uh what we believe were true and do a pretty good job for getting the times we were false, or even more so, we find reasons to denigrate the things that come to us if they go against our beliefs. So um, let me just give an example. Uh, my mother used to you know, like to say a lot that every time she went and washed the car, it would rain that day. Now, did she actually do a careful statistical analysis and uh, compared rainy days when she did and did not wash the car? No, 
What did she actually do? She remembered that sometimes going and getting the car washed and raining that day. And those were the things that stuck out in her mind and confirmed every time that there was a rainstorm after her car being washed. It's like, oh, I'm right again. I'm right again. It's like, but you did not also record and write down all the times that that was false. Now, this is obviously, you know, just a small toy example, but this is something principally we do with, you know, most of our beliefs. And so if I come along and I try to show some sort of piece of evidence to uh, John right now that goes against something that he believes deeply, he's probably going to first react and say, well, here's the problems with that, or here's the reasons I shouldn't accept that. Uh, but conversely, if I gave a paper that confirmed uh, something that he believed deeply, he'd probably be less critical of it, even if it had the same sorts of problems in both cases. Uh, this has actually been studied with like groups like with political bias, for example, uh, show people that believe um, in gun rights, show them a paper that uh, uh, more guns means more violence, and they'll find reasons to disagree with it. Uh, show them a paper that says the opposite. They think it's great. They don't find the same level of criticism. And of course, if you do that with the other side, you see the same sort of uh, disparity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that really does affect us all. You know, we, we will ascribe more value to something that, that, that defends, that confirms our already held, you know, view on something and less value to contrary evidence and and you know that's when you know when i was writing my resurrection book it's like uh, what's going on here because you and i christian are are evaluating the same we have the same evidence here but i come to this conclusion and you come to that conclusion and those conclusions are so utterly different what is going on here is ostensibly psychological you know and therefore dealing with evidence uh, is 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 a psych psychological thing, and obviously this is going to affect scientists as well. But what yeah. you have with the scientific method is you have the hope that those inaccuracies that might come out as a result of those psych psychological biases is eventually ironed out and corrected in the self correcting mechanism of of the scientific method. Right, right. Um, I don't remember who had done the work, but they're supposed to be like mathematically demonstrated that if you have uh, two people with different opinions on things and you give them time to present each other's evidence to each other um, and to discuss that fully, they should converge to um, a final agreed upon uh, uh, answer. But of course, how often is it the case that we go into a discussion with someone and at the end, both people agree? <laughs> so, uh, so that means either there is more background information that isn't being shared that illustrates that there isn't enough time to go through the full discussions or there's a psychological component. Usually there's a combination thereof. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's a beautiful segue onto this idea that, that what, why is it? Um, and I've talked, and I do apologize to my regular viewers because I talk about this a lot, but why, why is it that um, a, a, Christian will be um, evaluating things in such a different way and ascribing such different value to uh, certain claims that an atheist doesn't, right? And and what's going on here is ostensibly psychology, but but it's to do with terror management theory and the idea that you know uh, what's happening quite often. So uh, the example I often give is say that you're a creationist, right? You're a young earth creationist. And I come to you and say, right, here's evidence that the that the earth is not 6,000 years old. It's in fact a lot older than that. And I present you with that evidence. What's going on is not you evaluating that evidence on the basis of how good the evidence is and then adjusting your worldview to adapt to the, the superiority of the evidence. Because because what's happening is by me presenting that evidence, I am um, challenging your entire worldview. And with your entire worldview of things like your belief in the afterlife and the access to eternal heaven and paradise for, for forever. And that's massive. So if I'm going to come to you and say it doesn't matter what I'm talking about, in this case, it's the age of the earth and present you with that evidence that obviously shows that the earth is older than 6000 years old. What I'm really doing is coming to you and saying, you're not going to go to heaven forever, eternally. So therefore, your your brain has to, has that cognitive dissonance, you have to deal with that evidence in some way. And it's, it's more likely than not going to be a rejection somehow of that evidence, because it's more important that you go to heaven or that you believe that you go to heaven forever than 
the, the earth is indeed older than 6,000 years old. Is that fair? Right. Yeah. Especially with you bringing up terror management, uh, the fight or flight uh, mechanism that we have. So uh, I was thinking like, you know, the way that we end up changing our minds, we have to basically have the room to like stop and think about our own thinking to do metacognition. And if you're in a situation where you are not comfortable doing that, then uh, it's much less likely for that to happen. If your defenses are up, you don't have the comfort to actually then look into your own uh, mind and think about why am I thinking that way? Why am I uh, feeling about things this way? You're not giving yourself that time to process through because you feel threatened at that moment. Uh, you know, even if it is just a discussion about how old is a rock. <laughs> yeah. If it has all those other, you know, moral or metaphysical implications to it. But I mean, you know, fundamentally, it should be something, you know, that we could be completely rational about. How old is this rock? But if you then say, well, this also commit, you know, the answer to that question, you know, also has other frightening implications. Well, your mind isn't going to stop and say, well, why do you feel frightened? It's going to say you're frightened, you know, attack the the, the bear that's going yeah. at you right now. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's true. I mean, I've been involved in many sort of um, meetings in my teaching background to do with, you know, being able to deal with people who have really high, high anxieties. And if you, uh, in fact, one of my own children is, is falls into this category. Um, the, the, you know, if you think about your head as a bucket, the, the more full of anxiety it is, the less space there is for rationality. Uh, you know, it's like either or really. And, and if you're, if you're highly anxious, then you are not going to be thinking rationally. So yeah, exactly. If you, if you're presenting them with evidence against their worldview, and that invalidates them from from accessing eternal bliss then they're going to be pretty highly anxious uh and and unfortunately you know we're we're pretty susceptible to wishful thinking which is like i really want to believe that heaven exists and that is more important than dealing honestly with the evidence at hand uh, and again you know that's yet another um cognitive bias you know to add um, so, you know, if, if you, if you, and I know this is perhaps, it's just an impossible question. Well, no, if, if you would, would arguing or discussing with someone who is a committed young earth creationist, how would you go about disabusing them of, of that incorrect notion? So the fact of the matter is they probably came to that conclusion, not because they did, you know, oodles of scientific research they might have gone on to answers in Genesis and seen like the propaganda statements they might have about science, which, you know, every other, you know, legit scientist can look at and see, and here's, you know, the 12 errors they made in this one sentence. Uh, but because there is a much more deep seated reason they've come to that, my thought is, okay, let's actually get to the root thing that's actually blocking them from doing that. So one thing I have not had a chance to try out and I really want to is see what happens if I present a person, the history of creationism, and actually show it's a modern uh, heresy that actually comes out of Seventh-day Adventism. Ooh. That's actually its history. So if you go back to the 19th century, uh, pretty much all major Christian denominations that already accepted the antiquity of the earth, they didn't have an issue with saying, okay, we're just going to interpret Genesis differently. But the one group that became really um, hogtied to seven-day creation was the seven-day Adventists because their uh, prophetess, Ellen G. White, uh, basically um, endorsed the um, uh, Bishop Usher chronology in her prophetics works. And the, some of the most early um, influential creationists um, were actually seven-day Adventists or followers of that and were like writing that to try to, you know, push and defend uh, White's, uh, you know, prophetic insights, supposedly. So, I would like to see what would happen when people say, hey, the beliefs you have is actually 19th century um, heresy and uh, you've been caught up in this sort of thing. So uh, I have not been able to try that out with someone to see what happens when you present that history of creationism and show them it's actually a very modern reaction to modernism pr coming primarily out of a group that you would call a bunch of heretics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think that, you know, taking on... Uh, a Socratic approach of like questioning people that and and by the questioning they unlock their own kind of realization of their wrongness 
you know, rather than saying you're wrong because X, Y, and Z, you, you present them with a question. You say, would you do this or would you do that? Oh, so you've done that. So how does that affect that? And then, you know, the Socratic dialectic yeah. method of questioning, you know, which is involved in modern day approaches to coaching and whatnot, you know, is, a, I think, a really useful technique to unlock people's yeah. Um, incorrect views. I put that up because we were talking about this beforehand. That damn, I wonder <laughs> I should be in the Swinburne Oppie debate. Unfortunate schedule. Definitely here, Jake. Definitely here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and thank you, Jake, uh, for your support and your kind super sticker. That is really very cool of you. You're an awesome supporter of the channel. Yes, Jake. Uh, you just made two very good to correct decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Chindi is also a fantastic supporter of the channel as a, as a Christian as well, I feel, which I always find. But Chindi is is a really interesting Christian by the point of fact that they they take on the the problematic ideas, the thorns in in the side of Christianity, and accept them. Say, right, this is a problem, but but honest enough to say, but actually, I you know I overcome that with faith, uh, which I think you know. I obviously would disagree, and I think that's that's you might as well. I think it's stronger. Uh, there are stronger reasons to 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 not believe, but but at least you're kind of you're almost like halfway there, I suppose. It, yeah. It's like it's better than just the than than just doing dishonest things with with the evidence that you're given and the arguments you're given and twisting the arguments. Say so, right, I accept that. That's fine. It's just that there must be a reason that 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 takes place, and I have faith that. that will overcome that confirmation bias is a big issue i'm probably uh by the way i'm probably maligning chindi and they're probably like no that's not what, that's not what i believe uh, michael Shermer stated it as counting the hits and ignoring the misses i was going to say that to you earlier because that's exactly what you're describing uh, loving the challenge uh challenges this discussion is presenting presenting to me keep up the great work thank you thank you thank you um, yeah and since he actually mentioned Shermer, we can also um i think there's an example of you know michael Shermer, you know running skeptic magazine but I've also seen, you know, examples of also him having the same sort of confirmation bias issues. Like for a long time, he was a skeptic of climate change. And a big part of that seemed to be that it kind of went against his own, like, uh, beliefs in more libertarian economics and uh, uh, that the free market is able to account for these sorts of things. I mean, I, my understanding is he completely accepts climate science now, uh, but he was resistant to it for a rather long time. And yeah, most likely because he was being biased by his previous beliefs. So if skeptics can do it, uh, obviously non-skeptics can do it too. It's, it's, it's human, which means, of course, there are things that we're probably mistaken about. In fact, this is actually an interesting problem that both of us have right now. We have lots and lots and lots of beliefs. Do you think all of our beliefs are correct? Uh, you and uh, I, John. I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, I, no, I mean, I'm going to have just probability-wise, I'm going to have incorrect beliefs. Exactly. So I, I agree. There must be something I am wrong about. I'm not so perfect. But do I think any particular belief I have is wrong? No, I think everything I think is right. Otherwise, I would have changed it. Yeah. So I'm in a conundrum. I know there's something I believe that must be false, but every single belief I have, I believe is true. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I, I suppose if I was to look deeply at myself, I'd say, you know, that which I do believe that is false that I think is true is going to be a result of well okay I'd have to think about that you know I mean it's going is is it going to be because I've been fed faulty information or is it my interpretation of that information is, is faulty because of confirmation yeah. biases I was gonna yeah yeah so it could yeah, be it's, it's hard and I think that's also actually something that bleeds into another important thing about science is the fact that no matter how confident we might be in something right now the thing that we need to do, the thing that should be the ethos of the scientist is to still go out and explore. Even if you think you've got it all right, you still need to go out there and discover new things because everything we have to have in our minds has to be provisional, probabilistic, could be overthrown with some sort of new evidence. We might realize there's some underlying assumption to our thought process that's ultimately faulty. And the only way we're going to know is having the ethos of saying, I don't know everything and I need to keep looking. So I think uh, there's a, you said an interesting word there, which is probabilistic. Can you talk a little bit about what is the difference between a scientific theory and a scientific fact? And the fact yeah. that uh, the idea of the knowledge, well, for me, knowledge is a probabilistic thing outside of cogito ergo sum. So I would say, and people might have different epistemological stances, 
But my stance, my my opening gambit is always like Rene Descartes, which is cogito agathism. I think, therefore, I am, which is to say that the only thing I know indubitably, 100%, without any doubt at all, is that whatever the thinking entity is that is thinking exists. Like, I, I, I can't doubt my own existence because in order to doubt my own existence, I need to exist to do the doubting. So if I'm experiencing, I'm existing, right? So that's 100%. But everything outside of that, I could be living in a matrix. I could be, you know, is it, is it, is, there's a non-zero chance of the, op of it being false. Yeah. So therefore everything is a probability. How does that affect, affect a scientific fact? And what is the difference between theory and fact? Yeah. The thing is, I think actually even most scientists don't do a good job of seeing the difficulty there. So let me give you something that's a fact. The, orbit of Pluto around the sun takes approximately 900 years. Have we ever actually observed the complete orbit of Pluto? No, we have not. It is not based on a direct observation and like somebody with a timer to see how long it takes Pluto to go around the sun. Again, we only discovered this um, body in the 1930s. It hasn't even had a hundred years of observation and yet we're projecting out this nearly millennium uh, time frame for what it's going to do. So, is it a fact or is it um, a theory or a hypothesis? That's, that's a, yeah, it's a, that's a great question. And of course, we, we would, in general parlance, call that a fact because there seems enough consensus and enough um, surety about the claim uh, to, to, it, to it, that being called a fact. Yeah, which which I uh, would would that be a fair a fair analysis? Yeah, I think there's also that with a fact is that it's also like this very clear singular sort of thing that we can go out and like it's a singular measurement or a singular result. While a theory, you know, entails a whole body of facts and theories and additional um, uh, explanations of what will go beyond it. So telling you that Pluto's orbit is about 900 years doesn't actually tell you about the other bodies in the solar system. It doesn't actually even tell you what the theory of gravity is or if the Newtonian versus the Einsteinian versus some yet not developed quantum version of gravity is the existent one. That, that fact is basically the thing that has to be explained by the theories. And it also means that in certain important ways, epistemically, theories are a different beast because theory, you, something doesn't go from hypothesis to theory to fact. Theories explain facts. There, if anything the way that we assemble our facts together um, or project from our theory something so confidently that we can call it completely reliable for our purposes. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so therefore, you, it's almost like here's an observation, which like, we might call a fact, as in that thing happened there. And then we might explain it with this overarching theory. And then we might, you know, it's like turtles all the way down. So, do, but there's something called the Munchausen trilemma. So the Munchausen trilemma says, how do you ground any claim? So this is this is where science, we, we get on to talk about philosophy and epistemology necessarily. I, I'm sorry for those who don't like philosophy, but, it, it, you know, scientific method is a, an epistemological method. And we're talking about how do we find knowledge? So the Munchausen trilemma says there are three ways of grounding any claim. Right. You can either ground it infinitely backwards, which doesn't really ground it. It's just this. In, in, there's actually no grounding for it. It just goes on and on. And that seems intuitively a bit of a problem. Uh, the other way is grounding it in a, in a circle. So that's true because that's true. Why is that true? Because that's true. Why is that true? Because the first thing you said, and you've, you've got a circle, which is kind of, it works, but it's again, it's not intuitively not, not great. It doesn't really tell you an awful lot, maybe. So what usually happens in most sort of better established theories um, is that you have the third option, which is an axiom. So an axiom is a mm. self-evident truth. And we can talk, you know, you can talk about how problematic self-evident truth might be and like who gets to establish whether it's a self-evident truth. But you use axioms in mathematics and you get different axioms will produce an axiomatic um, sort of uh, system of, of doing the maths. And that math is true given the axioms. But mm -hmm. is the axiom true? Well, depends how far, far you take the self-evident truth. So the reason I bring this in is because when you're talking about different scientific theories, one of the things that we talk a lot about in, in atheism 
uh, and science and epistemology is is methodological naturalism. Would you like to explain that and why that's important or not in, in doing science? Yeah, so it's normally explained as the way we are going to try to explain things in science is that the causes have to be completely naturalistic and compared to then with supernatural causes where you have some sort of uh, conscious entity that comes in to produce some sort of result that you wouldn't expect from the unconscious interactions of the other sorts of things in the world. So whether it's angels and demons, gods and ghosts, you are excluding them from the plausible explanations for your results. And you're instead going to explain things based on the regularities that you see in the non-supernatural uh, processes. So, so in other words, when you drop like a bunch of parachutes with weights on and you're testing how quickly they fall and air resistance or something like that, and one of them falls in, in a way that's quite anomalous and you're like, oh, how do we explain this? What methodological naturalism say, says or says you shouldn't do is you don't go, oh, that one fell really, really, it took a long time to fall. Maybe God was cushioning the 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 weight with his ha invisible hands and of course you don't say that because that's a conversation killer and it's like you can't test it and it's just a mere assertion so therefore yeah. we, we we get rid of any kind of explanation that involves the supernatural and and we just assume everything works naturalistically um are there any problems with with assuming that or taking on that method well usually the biggest problem is that when you have that sort of approach, you don't actually have clear indications about what to expect from it. So uh, let me give an example from the history of science. So if we were to go back to the 17th century, uh, Galileo writes his stuff. He does his whole Galileo thing. Uh, he does a couple of Figaro's and then he dies. After that, um, uh, one of the last really big efforts to maintain geocentrism is written by a, another um, Roman Catholic uh, Jesuit uh, by the name of uh, Giovanni Battista Riccioli. And first off, he does some extremely good empirical results that actually overturns things that um, Galileo thought. For example, um, Galileo had some uh, incorrect statements he said about pendulums. Giovanni, uh, uh, Riccioli basically uh, did some very careful research to show that actually the angle that you start a pendulum from does have a small effect on its... Um, uh, period going back and forth. Galileo thought even if you pulled it at 90 degrees or just one degree, it'll give the same period. Galileo was wrong about that. And Riccioli um, really, really went deep into that. So that way he could produce really accurate pendulum measurement results. So he could really measure time very accurately. Um, now that also meant that he would he also double check uh, Galileo's statements about heavy objects and light objects falling at the same uh, rate of acceleration that turned out to be true. Uh, but among the things that Riccioli did was also try to explain how the solar system worked based on geocentrism. And among the things that he had to do is basically say, I don't really have a theory of force. So how do the planets go around the sun? Angels push it. And why not? I mean, yeah. I, and at that point, it's just like, OK, so why are the angels pushing this particular way rather than anything else? And when you have that sort of thing, it does not really lend itself well to coming to the next inspiration. Now, conversely, let's talk about the greatest uh, scientist uh, considered of all time, Sir Isaac Newton. And he basically says, OK, let's suppose the force pulling down apples is the same fundamental force pulling on the moon. And let's say that that force falls off as a distance of one or it falls off as one over distance squared. He could then literally do the math because we knew how far the moon was away to realize what the rate of acceleration of the moon would be compared to that apple. We know the rate of the acceleration of the apple, again, because of Galileo. And he worked out and realized, hey, the rate of acceleration of the moon is exactly what I'd expect with a one over square or one over distance squared law. And then if you do that, it's like, hey, I can also use this and completely reproduce the laws of planetary motion that Johannes Kepler gave us. Can you do that by saying angels push stuff? not without just being arbitrarily saying, well, that's just what the angels wanted to do. So there's no predictive value to asserting the supernatural. It, it, it's not going to help you. It's a yeah. conversation killer. It ends inquiry. I mean, that that's one of the things, you know, going back to the idea I was talking about before, which is that science is, this, is, is a kind of an expression of curiosity. And in order to posit some kind of supernatural explanation for something is to end that yeah. curiosity is to say, I've got the answer. 
you can't actually test it. We can't verify this. It, it, we can't even falsify it. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, it, it doesn't yeah. really help. Right. Though but, I would note, though, that I think the problem with that, though, is that by relying on angels and other entities that are supernatural, that are also fundamentally conscious, that we then have the problem of, okay, what would a conscious entity do in these cases? And as we already know, minds are pretty complicated things. Predicting what someone will do, even in just materialistic psychology, is difficult. Uh, and then, of course, if you do it with the divine and you basically have to say that there is no possible way to even describe God. He is just so awesome and beyond us. It's like, okay, so what would you predict from God existing? Uh Anything and nothing. It literally doesn't allow us to predict anything because of the nature of the supernatural beliefs. Now, conversely, if we actually said, okay, angels push things and they happen to have a psychology that is 100% predictable, then maybe supernaturalism could actually be useful. The fact of the matter is we basically fall on the supernatural just to say it did whatever they wanted to do at the time and stop asking hard questions. <laughs> I love how skeptical theism is is the approach that oh you can't know the mind of God and God moves in mysterious ways so you can't second guess God's intentions and then it's like well, why did that happen oh that's because God did this it's like so theodicies and skeptical the like within uh, theology is the idea that on the one hand apologists are always second guessing what God's motivations are and, and making predictions about what God would do. And on the other hand, when they get to a sticky, sticky situation, they go, Oh, you can't know the mind of God. It's like, well, you yeah, can't, you haven't your cake. Yeah. yeah. God created the universe so it could have life, but we don't know what God wants. It's like, so how do you know God produced the universe to make life rather than, you know, maybe the ultimate reason all the constants of nature are the way they are is so we can produce more iPhones. And that is the ultimate purpose of the universe. And to create iPhones, you had to create life first. Well, I like, I think it might have been in Richard Carrier's Sense of Goodness Without God. It, 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 he, he talked about how the uh, universe is fine-tuned, but fine-tuned for death. You know, mm. it's actually, you know, it's much harder to get life. And this is where, again, you have your cake and eat it. You, you say that um, on the one hand, you know, uh, so if the universe was had all the constants in place such that life was abundant, life could grow everywhere, life was just easy to come by. Then you're like, theists would say, look, the universe is designed for life. And then you're like, OK, we've got life on this pale blue dot here. But other than that, it looks pretty bleak out there. Yeah. And it's death and black holes. And oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, but the constants had to be in place just right for just here. It's like, so this is evidence for theism. And the opposite is that evidence for theism. It's like, yeah, it's again, an example of a bad hypothesis that it is just so difficult to even know what it predicts that, uh, yeah, if anything, if something and the opposite can both be evidence for it, you probably just don't have a good hypothesis. Yeah. And I found, I found, I was watching Midnight Mass on Netflix with my partner the other night. And, and that's a, sort of, it's a, it's a Mike Flanagan um, mini series with, with lots of religious overtones and sort of all ideas of religion and stuff. It's really good. I've only watched the first episode so far, but then I forget what happened in there, but I had to pause it and turn because I'm, God, my partner must get so bored of this. But I paused it, stopped it. Do you see what just happened there? Like she said something that, uh, that, that was like, if this happens, then that's evidence of God. But of course, the, they're also saying the opposite, which is if the opposite happens, that's evidence for God, which is to say that no matter what the no matter what the data is, that is evidence for God. This is just ridiculous. Anyway, but that, that's a really common sort of a trope that you get. Um, what, uh, there's, a, there's a paper by Jonathan Fishman that I read some years ago, which is um, that actually you can take the idea is that if supernatural yeah. is involved in, um, you know, if you posit the supernatural in, in some kind of explanation for data, then that that's really problematic. But in another sense, if, if the supernatural does get involved in naturalistic phenomena, if, if you like, then you should be able to test it. There's the idea yeah. that, that, you know, if it's having an effect on, on you know matter you should be able to in some sense test the supernatural i mean is there anything you have to say to that well the thing is uh that's absolutely correct and everything we've tried to do to avoid that i think has been either apologetics on the part of the religious or apologetics on the side of science communicators to try to avoid the conflict because uh 
you know, we've done the science on like, you know, prayer studies and it comes out negative. So uh, you either have to say we've disproved prayer or you have to say, well, science can't actually touch these subjects. And only one of them I really find is like the honest uh, derivation from it. Uh, and again, when it comes to the history of science, it's also worth noting the reason we've come to like this metaphysical naturalism thing is that if you go earlier into the history of science, you didn't have that requirement that um, all the causes had to be naturalistic. Uh, in fact, if you go to the Royal Society, uh, some of the things that like Robert Boyle wanted to do was actually go and test miracles to find out which version of Christianity was the true one. They ended up eventually stopped doing that after a while because they couldn't find any true miracles. So there you go. The, yeah, the yeah the problem was not that supernaturalism can't be tested. Is the problem is that it keeps coming out to being wrong. You might as well, you know, in some ways it's kind of similar to like uh, the uh, popular version of Freudian psychology. Whatever it is, whatever you say, what is going on is you want to have sex with your mother, and no matter what actual thing you said, one way or another, it always comes back to uh, wanting to have sexual relations with your parents. Uh, <laughs> Now, I, you know, that's the hyperbolic version of Freudian psychology, but no matter what I tell you, one way or another, I'm going to find a way to connect what you just said or what you dreamed or how yeah. you stubbed your toe to connect to those underlying sexual desires. Heads I win, tails you lose. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, you know. um, yeah. So uh, that, and that reminds me, um, uh, talking about excellent, not that what you just saying, something you mentioned before, but um, again, to mention Richard Carrier, he, he used a great... Um, a, like analogy for how naturalism is is a better explanatory uh better explanation for data for any anything that we don't know probabilistically than supernaturalism and that's the idea that the over time naturalism has supplanted supernaturalism uh, as an explanation for data so you know thousands of years ago you would have looked at the the thunder and lightning in the sky and said well that's thor uh hammer and chariots and whatever and that explains that but then when we understand that it's actually ionized particles or whatever it is charged particles and this and that then you're like okay naturalism supplanted supernaturalism as an explanation for the data but it's never gone the other way so supernaturalism yeah. has never supplanted naturalism and that's really really worth thinking about because if you if you if you're like putting your money on a on a particular um, explanation for something we don't know, consciousness, the universe. Then, actually, what do we have better probability? What what if you're a betting person? Would you bet on a horse that has won every single race for the last ten thousand races? Naturalism, it's supply, it's won that race against supernaturalism and supplanted supernaturalism every time. Or would you bet on the horse that's never won the race, never won a race? So the form is really, really poor. It's lost 10,000 races in a row. You're going to put these two horses against each other to explain, right, we don't know which one's going to win. But inductively, like, wh what do we have better, you know, reason to believe is the correct explanation, naturalism or supernaturalism for consciousness well i would say naturalism before before we even entertain the data like this is a kind of bayesian analysis almost yeah is that something you'd agree with that it's fair um i would note though that the analysis there is only on the evidentiary portion of the bayesian uh calculation there is still the priors and i think also the more careful analysis of the prior probabilities is also favorable to naturalism because if you want to look at what's the prior prob probability of naturalism versus supernaturalism for say the nature of the universe, stop and ask yourself, okay, what is inherently more complex? What takes more time to explain to actually then figure out what the predictions are? And uh, the tool set that I have come across that uh, does this actually comes from computer science is called uh, Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, it's basically to say, what is the shortest program, computer program that you could write that the outputs will give you the expected results. Is so this basically Occam's imagine razor in, in like computer science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you could basically imagine, okay, I am going to write a simulation of the universe. And I will, you know, you know, want to have like you know the laws of nature to pop out one way or the other. So if in supernaturalism, the first thing I have to do is program and perfectly describe the mind of God. If I'm being told uh, especially like on uh, apotheism, that God is completely indescribable, that any words that we use is never sufficient to describe them. Well, that means you're telling me the Kamogorov complexity of God is literally unbounded. It is effectively infinite. 
which means anything else I give you, any other uh, explanation has at least finite Kolmogorov complexity, which means inherently it has to be a better explanation and we don't even have to like start the research. You've literally told me you can't even describe your thesis. I at least can. You're not even wrong at that point. That's so, interesting. So yeah. I, I've said that before with um, with the Kalan cosmological argument, which is like my my theory is the universe is a brute fact, right? And that's really simple compared to and does a just as good explanation, I would argue. And obviously, you know, you have to go into a bit of argument about this, but than God plus the universe, right? Explains everything, and then you know you've got to explain how the God is a brute fact and blah blah blah. But it's like we now have this massive contingent existence upon contingent upon God. And you got to, you know, and it's like you're multiplying these entities, these explanatory entities unnecessarily. And therefore, you yeah. know, that just fails on Occam's razor or that algorithm you were talking about or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will note though, there is one issue with Kogamorov complexity. Like I say, it's supposed to be the shortest like computer program you could write, but there is no like explicit way you can do the calculation to find out what that is. So the best you can do is like put limits on what that complexity might be. But like I say, especially like on apotheism where you literally cannot describe God, then you have told me the Kogelmark complexity is literally unbounded. Yeah. yeah and my theories cool. of nature are at least bounded. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about, about science in general what, and, and religion. Uh, what about Stephen Jay Gould's Noma, non-overlapping magisteria? Do you have anything to say about that? So he he would, uh, do, would you want to describe that? Is that something? Yeah. So the idea there um, from Gould, uh, the um, now, you know, unfortunately late um, Harvard biologist and paleontologist, the idea that religion and science talk about, describe, explain completely different spheres that don't actually um, talk to each other. So a claim in a religion isn't related to a claim in science and vice versa. That uh, if science comes out and says water is composed of two hydrogen atoms and a water atom, uh, uh, religion has nothing to say about that. If religion says God is a trinity, science has nothing to say about that. They just are completely different ways of talking about separate areas. And I think that is, first off, historically wrong. That has not actually been true for the history of science and religion. Um, and if anything, what Gould, I would say, is trying to be aspirational, that if uh, religion were to not make any claims that related to science, then there would be no conflict. But that is basically then Gould taking a claim, people should take these kinds of theologies rather than the ones that have historically existed. So I say, I look at Noma as less a description of science and religion in the wild versus science and religion in an ideal circumstance that basically has never existed. Yeah. So, I mean, going back to what Lex uh, Lace says here, thanks for joining in, Lex, by the way. Um, he's a uh, regular at my, uh, my column on Only Sky. So it's provisional and probabilistic as applicable to ancient history as it is to science. Uh, and actually, you know, this is where you're talking about the, the religious claims aren't just, just theology sitting in nothing. These are often claims you know, ensconced in the historical context uh, that, that therefore you need to do a bit of history, which is then actually doing a bit of science. You know, yeah. hi history isn't just making stuff up. You're, you're quite often using the scientific method or, or to some degree uh, to a, a, and probab probabilistic analyses to, to come up with, with a, a valid scientific theory you know, uh, sorry, historical theory about what took place. And then if you're going to apply that to, say, the resurrection, I mean, that's exactly what I did in both, you know, again, it's my book spanning time, but in both the uh, resurrection book and the nativity book, which is exactly that, Bayesian uh, analysis, probability analysis of the claims, the historical claims. And then you can say, well, okay, if these fail probabilistically, then, uh, and and again, you can look at, you you can look at science, in terms of, you know, doing dating data and stuff like that. And you say that, actually, I don't think you're justified in believing this. And if you're not justified in believing this as a historical thing, then I think the theology falls apart uh, because it's all connected. So I think, yeah, I think the Noma idea that they are completely non-overlapping is, is problematic. Yeah. 
and from what I can tell, even most uh, religious people wouldn't even want it to be true in the first place. If your religion is literally saying nothing about the world we live in, it doesn't sound like an interesting belief system. And conversely, yeah. if science can't give you any insight into um, the way that God works in the world, uh, again, it seems like an extremely empty sort of theology that you would have. It's like, yes, God does absolutely nothing that you could ever see, feel, touch, taste, or test. It's only going to be in our mythologies, in which case you basically have turned religion not into uh, this way of like, you know, interacting with the universe. You've basically turned it into a, another form of um, the Harry Potter series and you're just not supposed to even think about it in any sort of scientific way. You're just supposed to go to Universal Studios, see the sites, enjoy the ride, but not actually uh, go with anything else there. And if that's really what people thought religion was, I don't think it would have anywhere near the power that it does. I, do, I don't know how people like Catholics, for example, who believe in transubstantiation. So transubstantiation is the idea that when you eat the wafer and drink the wine, the wafer and the wine actually, actually, actually turn into the you know, the body and the blood of Christ. Yeah. And, and they really were well, supposed to believe that doctrinally. Um, and I just think, well, science can tell you that it doesn't do that. <laughs> like, it, it just, it, like yeah. the wine just doesn't turn into blood and the, and the bread yeah. doesn't turn into flesh. Well, funny enough, actually, that you bring that up because um, some of the more recent research on the Galileo affair, the, you know, Galileo getting in trouble with the Catholic Church and then under, ending up in house arrest for the rest of his life. You know, he was supposed to have been, you know, brought in front because of his declarations uh, about the earth going around the sun rather than vice versa. But uh, one of the things that people didn't realize that also Galileo was pushing atomism in one of his other works. And the thing is with atomism, is that it also undermined the attempts of the... What is, can you explain what ad atomism is here? Oh, okay, yeah, atomism. Literally that the universe is made up of atoms. Uh, you know, he didn't have like atomic theory like we do in modern times, but basically the atomic theory of like Democritus and Lucretius uh, and that sort of tradition. Um, now, conversely, like what was like a lot of the scho uh, scholastic theologians, the people reading Aristotle and that, were trying to say like how they could explain transubstantiation is that while the bread and wine would have the accidents of the appearance and taste of water and wine, its essence was actually turned into water and wine. And that was the miracle that happened at mass. But with Galileo's uh, atomism, that there isn't this distinction between accidents and essences. So this was also then something that might have actually also caused him to finally be condemned because it's like, oh, he's also promoting this stuff that literally undermines Catholic tradition, but which the Protestants would be totally okay with. So what, why? So going back right to the beginning again, what? what uh, and that's very interesting, by the way. Thank you for adding that. Um, and I love speaking to you because you bring in like the real historical exemplification of these of the of the stuff we're talking about. Um, wh why is it that the atheists are more scientific? You know, <laughs> oh, look how wonderful atheists. We pat ourselves on the back with being more scientific. But what, what is it about skepticism and atheism? Do you, like, you know, it, uh, I don't know. It, 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 well, I don't know. Can you, can you answer that? I mean, is it, is it as obvious as the fact that science as a method is a much better method for arriving at truth? And if you use science, then you're more likely to not need god or or you know disprove aspects of god and therefore it will lead inexorably to to atheism so in that case i kind of see the question of is it an accident that atheists are more scientific or scientists more atheistic or is it actually something fundamental to the nature of science itself i'm going to lean that it's more an accident in that if religion were true if god did exist then we also would find scientific reasons to see that's the case I would say the problem is that we've gone, we've done lots of science and all the things that we expected God to do or the things we would expect God to do hasn't been turning out to be correct. Um, we don't need a divinity to keep the world going. The first law of motion from Newton basically says yeah, things you know, continue to go on their own just fine. It doesn't need to be continuously pushed to, or sustained as like in uh, uh, you know, Catholic traditions and uh, like even like uh, Edward Fezzer in his... Uh, neo uh scholastic attempt to like you know rescue god he basically has to go back to 
you know, the idea that somehow God is necessary to sustain the universe, but literally the first law of motion is no, you don't need that. <laughs> so it's things like that come along or the prayer studies that come along or the fact that theology uh, has failed to actually, you know, give consistent results. If the fact that my religious beliefs are geographically determined strongly, that is not something you expect on theism. So I'm going to say it's kind of an accident that science leads to atheism or atheists seem to be more accepting of science because I think that's where the evidence is pointed. And if it really were the case that God did exist, then science would have shown it by now. Oh, that's really interesting. So what you're basically saying is, and I've talked about this before, like if you want to check out my previous videos, you viewers like Emerson Green, when I talked with him about the meager moral fruits arguments, and we talked about a whole other video about abductive arguments. What are abductive arguments? They're arguments to the inf inference to the best explanation, which is to say that if you have like a, a data or, or yeah, if you have data, some observations, what theory, what hypothesis that God exists or that God doesn't exist, does that data better support? Like just, and, and it's not going to disprove or prove God or atheism, but mm -hmm. what it does is you, you then start adding all these different data set points up. And if they all generally side towards atheism, then you, you, you're you better off, you know, you're more justified in believing that atheism is true. So what you're saying here in in this respect is that science in and of itself well, no, the fact that science doesn't appear to support um, or verify God's existence in any in any way is itself mm -hmm. an inference. Like some people might say, well, that doesn't that's silent on the God issue. But you're saying if it's not verifying science, then actually, you know, it, uh, given one hypothesis or the other, God or not God, it actually favors not God. Is that is that what you'd be saying? Yeah, because the religions of the world have had, you know, beliefs about the world that we can go and see if they're true or not. It was, you know, believed that um, all the people in the world ultimately were descended from a singular atom, you know, in the historical past. And also that also meant that uh, there shouldn't be people on the other side of the world. And then we discovered, oh, there's continents over there. Uh, how do they relate to the, you know, the salvation message? Are they even human then? Because they sure look human, but we can't explain how they, you know, got there if they were descendants of Adam uh, or. How, how do that? How do they speak so many different languages? Oh, the yeah. Tower of Babel. Babel. Oh, ah, yeah. right. Okay, of course. Yeah, that explains it. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it was even like a theological issue, like once like um, the Americas were discovered and the people there, they were like, well, how does that fit into like the Edemic genealogy? Uh, you know, these people have been separate yeah, and how did they get there, especially after the whole flood event? If everyone was supposed to come off a boat in the middle of uh, 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 the Middle That's East. That's present, yeah. Yeah, how, how, you know, how did they get over there and become, you know, so different? It, it seemed like, hey, how do we explain that? And you know, some people then took the opinion that, oh, they must not actually be human. They're not ensouled. And so we can treat them like beasts of burden. That's really good. I'm re writing a um, a feature article on aliens <laughs> and <laughs> what effect uh, discovering alien life forms, like uh, sentient life forms, intelligent life forms would have on religion. And if you believe that Jesus went through the atonement necessarily to atone for um the sins of humanity then if there are like a billion other life forms out there that are equivalent to humanity does that mean there have been a billion other jesuses like are all are all sentient creatures um moral creatures and if they're all moral creatures are they all fallen like we are in terms mm -hmm. of you know god's expectations and if that's the case, then Jesus has existed as Jesus, but in different kind of alien <laughs> Jesus, like a billion times. And so how how does that fit in with theology? So I've asked a few sort of theologians, like how if we discovered intelligent life, would that change? How, would, that, would that affect your theology at all? Or would it just be, would you just envelop that in as in part of, yeah, okay, there would be a billion Jesuses. What's your problem? Yeah. Um, or there's also the idea that, you know, I'm, I was going to bring up ancient aliens, but with a little bit of a twist. Um, so the idea that uh, extraterrestrials came in the past and influenced the development of human civilization one way or the other, uh, you know, I mean, sure, that's on the History Channel. And now apparently it's in front of the U.S. Congress, um, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, there were hearings about UFOs the other day, but yeah, no, and that was uh, I yeah. saw a tip on CNN or something. Yeah. but I didn't, I haven't seen it, but yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, but uh, besides those sideshows, like, you know, the idea that aliens were actually in our past and actually gave us our various religions, that was actually something promoted by the Soviet Union as propaganda to try to undermine the West. Yeah. Uh, this is something I actually discussed uh, about a month or so ago on Myth Vision, that the, the Soviets were actually producing literature that would be Western facing to try to show that um, what people thought were like encounters with the supernatural were actually encounters with aliens in the past. So all you, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims in, outside of, you know, the communist world, you've been uh, duped and you've been actually worshiping extraterrestrials this whole time. So you should be getting on board with complete metaphysical materialism like us good communists. I'm pretty sure we discussed that at, in one of our uh, earlier videos, either just me and you or when we were with someone else. I, I do remember that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we I think we quickly talked about it. But yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I say, so we have to be careful because um, it, it has that tinge that it is literal old Soviet propaganda. <laughs> yeah. But it is the question that, you know, if aliens were actually in our past uh, – and if that makes the case that, hey, uh, religions are just accidents of people misremembering what uh, other species did, that also seems like it could be undermining of religion. Or we just now say, yep, Jesus was an alien. We're going to worship alien Jesus. Yeah, well, why not? Um, West 501, wow, I'm really late. No worries. We are going to wrap up in about 10 minutes. Uh, this was supposed to be an hour, but who, I can't do an hour. It's just too much to talk about. Um, and and I do excuse us. I mean, this is this was supposed to be kind of structured, but we jumped everywhere because you've got to and, you know, whatever. If, if you don't like it, tough. We, we, that's what we're doing. Um, if you don't like it, you should donate $10. And if you do like it, you definitely should donate $10. <laughs> it's, it's a religious uh, epistemology <laughs> effect. Um, so, Jake K., thank you so much for, for Euros 99. Really, really, really kind of you. Uh, what are Dr. Adair's opinions claiming that science and faith aren't in conflict because Galileo and Newton, etc., were theists? And this this is our idea. And mm -hmm. this might be this is slightly different to, to what I hear so often. And you get people like Rodney Stark saying this, which is to say that that Christian theology uh, or Christianity as, as a whole worldview was a necessary component in the in the development of science. And you might have a lot to say about that and whether actually yeah. elements of science predated Christianity and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And did we, was it, is it just the result of humanity? But yeah, so the idea that, that, that Christian, one, how responsible is Christianity in developing science? And two, you know, uh, these great scientists were theists, uh, surely religion and science can happily coexist. Yeah. So here's the thing. If you point to people from 400 years ago, and then you're wondering why we shouldn't believe the same things they did 400 years ago. You might want to say, well, what else have we learned since then? Now, for example, Galileo was an astrologer. We've learned a lot about, you know, astronomy uh, since then. And we now know astrology is bunkum. Newton was an alchemist. We've now learned that uh, the underlying, you know, metaphysics of alchemy is false. And now we have chemistry. So that sort of claim that Newton and Galileo were theists, therefore there's no conflict, would be about the same way of saying there's no conflict between science and astrology, even though the conflict is extremely stark. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, the question then, well, did uh, religion at least provide some sort of impetus or some sort of uh, structuring to science? Well, again, the fact that we were seeing scientific advanced development theorizing even before the development of Christian monotheism. Uh, the fact that also you have to say which Christianity, because again, it only, you know, developed in one particular uh, subset of the world. It basically, we're seeing this, you know, appearing in Western Europe in a particular period of time, over a thousand years after the development of Christianity and it becoming an institution of great power. If Christianity is a force to make science, why did it take a thousand years and only happen in one particular place? Why didn't we see basically... Um, science explode in the Byzantine Empire? Why didn't we see like uh, Nestorian Christians in China developing science if that was the reason for it? If you're only finding in one particular place a thousand years after the cause, it's probably not the case that, sci that Christianity is the cause of science. It's something else. And it's also worth noting, well, what were the causes of science in early modern Europe? Did something else happen before then that kind of changed the name of the game? And one of those things was the Renaissance and the rediscovery of what the Greeks and Romans had been doing and their philosophies and their scientific works, including among them uh, Lucretius's um, De Rem Natura, which was one of the works that uh, basically re reintroduced atomism, uh, reintroduced Epicureanism, uh, 
got some people into trouble. Like, for example, Giordano Bruno uh, basically completely yeah. fell in love with that. And what happened in the end? Did Christianity embrace that a scientific approach or did it decide those sorts of thoughts deserve people being burned at the stake? <laughs> yeah, they kind of they forced um, Bruno to embrace fire, which. Yeah. You know, um, and it's interesting. I remember writing uh, a couple of articles years ago on uh, how Christianity is not responsible for science and the development of science. And, you know, you talk about things like, well, if if everyone was by default Christian, then anything that comes out of that is like the correlation fallacy. Yeah. You know, you're going to you're going to say, well, it only happened because, you know, they were Christian. Well, yeah. no, it, it could have happened because they were humans and right. Christian. <laughs> But, and yeah, then it's and like, it well, is worth what? noting that there were also, um, before the scientific revolution, if you go to uh, the Islamic world and the scientific and medical work that was going on there, uh, it may be worth saying that it didn't reach scientific revolution status, but they were still basically um, reading the, the ancient works. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it, it uh, just to give an example of like the sort of signs that they were doing that you would say that like ultimately they are wrong, but you could see the approach they're taking. So yeah. in the second century AD, uh, Claudius Ptolemy comes out with his, you know, uh, giant book to explain the solar system with epicycles. And it basically is the norm for astronomy for explaining the solar system for well over a thousand years. In the Islamic world, they, of course, accepted the geocentric world that it used and the math he used for it. But they also saw fundamental physics problems with his model. In particular, in uh, Ptolemy's model, the planets don't actually go around the Earth. They go around a point out in space called the equant, which is off from the center of the Earth. And that was the only way he could basically get like the math to work out for his system. And everyone else was just like, well, how does that physically work? This goes against like our Aristotelian idea of how physics works. So how do we reconcile our, you know, our astronomical theory with our physical theory? And there were many attempts to try to find out other mathematical models that could do away with this weird addition that Ptolemy had and make it at least physically consistent. That sounds a lot like science to me, coming up with something that tries to incorporate all of your background knowledge and create new uh, methods to correlate everything together and make predictions to what you're going to see in the sky. So there's something that was called Al-Tusi couples, uh, named after a is, uh, Muslim uh, astronomer, uh, Al-Tusi, and he comes up with a new mathematical way to give the same sort of like um, odd motions that the planets would have, but not have to have those weird features that Ptolemy had in his model. And the interesting thing is, you can also see those Altusi couples in Copernicus. It's not sure yet if Copernicus was reading those works or not, but we see the same like mathematical tools there. So it, to me, it looks like, hey, this looks like scientific development. This looks like at least scientific efforts. And it was coming from outside the Christian world and then came into the Christian world and then convinced somebody, what if we did that? <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and I remember as well when I wrote that, those articles some time ago that actually there were elements of the scientific method that we talked about earlier um, that were that were evident in in Chinese thinking and Chinese hmm. you know ancient Chinese um, you know scientific discoveries and inventions but but yeah. they had like really prototypical like versions of the scientific method and so you know it's it's it uh, you see this a lot with like the legal codes of the Bible it's the idea that the, there's biblical exceptionalism it's like you see everything on a trajectory uh, and you see the Bible in the middle of that trajectory and you say look the Bible is responsible for all this stuff that came after it. It's like, yeah, but you're forgetting all the stuff that went before the Bible. You're just taking it <laughs> out of the context of its exactly. trajectory and saying, this is the starting point. This is what everything came from. And then, like ignoring the rest of the ancient Near Eastern history and stuff from around the world. And it's just like, ah, oh, really problematic. Um, yeah. Thank, yeah. Th thank you, Aaron. No, it's, uh, hopefully that's answered Jake's point. Um, uh, vaguely agnostic in, in say, you know, heard heard your, your uh, wonderful... Um, calls to uh very kind donations uh it says heard a voice tell me to donate ten dollars sounded a lot like Aaron. It, it it might have been or or it was some maybe divine uh, intervention um so as we draw towards a close in our meander through this and we, we were talking uh i i don't know uh, you guys in the live chat here but there, there there's a chap called reginald finley who used to be known as the infidel guy or uh, who i followed years and years ago uh, when I was really getting into the whole philosophy of, of religion stuff. And he's now got involved. He's kind of gave up 
that side of stuff and then took up science and science education and is now you know getting involved in you know uh, the academic world and science education uh, and uh, we reached out to to see if he wanted to do um you know uh something like this together with him so hopefully just going forward that that's going to happen so that's something to look out for um uh so just so the my point of saying that is that this is kind of perhaps a bit of a precursor to what we we might do then but we might have a couple of these i don't know it depends how how much free time you've got aaron and whether 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 you or you you'd agree to have another chat along these same lines but what what else would you like to add in terms of uh, science and its its intersection with with atheism skepticism. Did we finish off talking about how atheism is is connected to science? In, in the... um, I think so, but it might be worth highlighting that an important point because since my suggestion is atheists are more scientific or or more willing to uh, go along with the science is I think in many ways an accident of what has been revealed through the science so far, which also means because science is a process of discovery and a revision, it really could be the case in 50 years that we get new exciting evidence that should make us change our mind that shows theism is actually underlying the best uh, explanation for things. And in that case, then science better lead us to theism than atheism. That's the thing that I would say about the fact that it's an accident rather than a necessity. So wherever the science goes, I'll follow. And if that happens to be to heaven, okay. And if it happens to just be a uh, grave with nothing after it, then uh, so be it as well. I want to know the truth one way or the other. Yeah, and I think it's worth re-emphasizing the, the point that what, what has um, what has the religious epistemological system if you can call it that i don't and there's no <laughs> what is the religious epistemo epistemology it appears to be this in the case of christianity this book has some kind of axiomatic you know truth to it uh, th that is untouchable <laughs> uh and it reveals truths about the world and that's that end of uh yeah. But it countenances slavery. Yeah, but no, it doesn't. But and this, <laughs> but, but what about you know killing homosexuals and so, no, yeah, but okay. Uh, and so you know, what has the religious epistemology added to our our, our you know bank of knowledge over the last two thousand years? Uh, uh, and has it added anything? I mean, realistically, has religion added any knowledge? It's added to our examples of wishful thinking. Uh <laughs> Uh, it's one of the things I've been exploring as well. Um, because of the efforts I've tried to see uh, in reading the literature on science and religion, of all the different ways that people then try to reconcile, whether it's the Genesis story with what we know from modern science, from cosmology, from uh, 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 atomic physics, from biology, how do we you know, reconcile that with Genesis uh, and the readings of that? And I look through that and of course, you know, there's the approach of, well, the Bible's right, so screw science. Uh, that doesn't get you very far because, you know, treating the Bible literally is going to get you in trouble because sometimes it's pretty clear that if you do that, you're just going to run into contradictions real hard and real fast. Like in the Psalms, it said that this, that God is the sun and a shield. If you take that literally, it's obviously a contradiction. It's also absurd uh, that God is a piece of Bronze Age uh, weapons technology. What? <laughs> if you realize, okay, there's metaphor being used. All right. So metaphor for what? And then if you are allowed to interpret that metaphor to whatever it needs to be, to be consistent with your background knowledge, you don't actually have knowledge because if you can only know what it means after you've told it what it has to mean, you don't actually have knowledge at that point. You can't justify what the book says to get to true beliefs. It's the, going the opposite direction. So I think the way theology has gone to try to tiptoe around and try to be conforming to scientific knowledge means that it's impossible for it to actually generate knowledge. The way it's done that, even if God exists, theology can't actually tell us anything. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree. It, it, yes, it's, it's, yeah, fully. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Lex says... 
well, what about Scientology? It's got science in the right in the name. Uh, this is the same for Christian science. I'd trump that with Christian science. So Christian scientists as a movement, the Christian science movement, surely, yeah. I mean, that, that has everything. I mean, that's NOMA right out the window. I mean, those are... Right. Like, yeah, and it's also worth noting that Christian science developed here in New England, so it's even more true because only true science comes out of New England. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you find true science came out of old England. Um, it, it moved. It moved. <laughs> moved in 1776, we declared that uh, independence and we're the only ones doing science now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll agree to disagree. Um, that's it. That's another debate to have on another day. Uh, look, if, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Adair uh, of the scientific nature, uh, please uh, throw them in there because we're going to have about two more minutes. Um, uh, but is there anything else you wanted to add? Is there anything you're working on at the moment? Anything you're particularly excited about? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, like one of the things I've been getting into is like the history of science and religion and how it's been displayed to the public. So I mentioned Soviet propaganda, but I've also been trying to look at it uh, from the other side of things. And uh, next week, I plan on taking a trip down to D.C. to actually go into the archives of the Smithsonian, because in the 1920s, the way that uh, science reporting seemed to fundamentally change. And I've seen an interesting contrast between before and after the Scopes monkey trial. And I want to do some digging there to see if uh, my hypotheses about what's happening there are actually true. So that's one thing I'm looking into of, oh, hey, is the way that we actually talk about science and religion changing uh, for the sake of trying to uh, uh, reconcile things, at least publicly, even if privately people don't believe it? Sorry, I'm just looking. There's a book uh, I wanted to find. It's one by Dr. Caleb Lack. I can't see it there. It is there somewhere. It's called... Uh, uh, talk to everyone for a couple of seconds. Yeah. Well, first off, yeah, if he mentions getting a book by Dr. Lack, I would recommend that as well, since he definitely knows his uh, stuff there when it comes to psychology and psychological research. Uh, okay, we're back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was this, telling them the terrible things about you. It's not hard. Um, uh, this is the classic way that I have an inability to finish a, a video. Because uh, uh, this just reminded me, uh, talking about the history of science. So this is a book by Caleb Black, um, Psychology Gone Astray, a selection of racist and sexist literature from early psychological research. And this is a really interesting book because it looks at um, like psychology as a science. Uh, some people call it a soft science. But, you know, in, in the early days of psychology, in the early 1900s, uh, you had people bringing their baggage to, to their scientific methods of doing literally the methodology of creating an experiment so if they are have this idea that the men are worth more than women or the white people are worth more than black people or so on then when they're creating their experiments to do looking into whatever kind of psychology then it's going to be horribly you know faulty and they're going to they're going to come up with bad data or they're going to manipulate data or just yeah. do bad bad science it's a really interesting look at uh, how you know early psychologists were doing bad psychology and bad science and and it's it's it, in a sense whilst it denigrates science in that way it, it then you know shows you how good it is as a method because it self-corrects over time and you know as long as you you've got robust methods uh you'll have uh, you know, hopefully robust data that comes yeah. along afterwards. So it's just the, the history of science can tell us a lot as well. Uh, yeah. In and fact, uh, I would say also a good book to supplement with that as well is one of the recent books by Naomi Oreskes, uh, if you are familiar with uh, that historian of science as well. Uh, she co-wrote um, Merchants of Doubt about the um, efforts by fossil fuel companies to basically pay scientists to come up with reasons to doubt the results there. Right. And the people doing that basically had, you know, jumped from like uh, doubting that cigarettes cause cancer to that uh, CFCs hurt the ozone to uh, climate denial, uh, all, all those sorts of things. Like it's even the same people very often uh, doing those sorts of things. So Oreskes also wrote another book uh, more recently called Why Trust Science and looking at like examples of like uh, from the history of science, 
why it's actually worth trusting uh, that it has those self-correcting mechanisms and the places where science has failed, um, why those self-correcting mechanisms weren't there, especially like when it came to like um, medicine and women's studies uh, that, you know, you had uh, men trying to describe how the uterus works, but wouldn't dare talk to a woman about it or let a woman do any sort of research with that. And it's like, as you can imagine, the results turn out to be not that great. Uh, so Oreski's uh, work there is one, great for justifying science on historical grounds, and two, you know, what to look for uh, for where science can go wrong, like what yeah. sorts of factors have to be in place to make sure that the mechanisms of science are doing what they need to do to make sure that we are actually making progress rather than just justifying our biases. Brilliant. And that's a great place to end. Um, and that's uh, interesting. Uh, I love your br breadth of knowledge and being able to, that sounds like a great book as well. Um, uh, being able to tie all these ideas together with, as, as I said earlier, with exemplifying um, those ideas in terms of the history of science and, and particular, you know, commentators on that. So thank you. Uh, thank you to all the supporters of the channel. Thank you for all for the very kind uh, donations that really, uh, like I always say, it justifies me doing this. I am uh, considering uh, starting up a Patreon, uh, but I don't know yet. I'm really torn with that idea. So anyway, watch out. Um, uh, that's yeah. Uh, and hopefully um, going forward, you know, grow the channel and be able to do do this uh you know, with better lighting for me or something, you know, who knows? Um, I don't look near, nearly as cool as, as Aaron does being surrounded by an event horizon. However, he is just about to be sucked in and killed instantaneously, whereas I, I'm just going to be sitting amongst, amongst a bunch of books. So, you know. Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, if I fall in, the most amazing thing of all happens. I'll fall in and you'll look at me and what it'll look like as I get closer and closer to the event horizon I will appear to have stopped. Time will appear to have stopped for me. But when I fall in, I'll fall in and everything will look fine. And when I look up, I will be able to see the entire future of the universe. Because inside the black hole, literally space and time flip. Yeah, but I don't believe that. Um, so <laughs> I just believe what I want. Uh, and then, and I, you, to me, look like you've got a halo. So I think you're an angel. And I think it's all about heaven or something. Well, unfortunately, if I am, I'm a halo that's uh, that my halo is highly radioactive. So I am a nothing but a giant angel of tumors. That's all I would be right now. Excellent. Nothing better. Anyway, uh, everybody, take care. Thank you. Uh, as ever, question everything, particularly yourselves. Uh, toodle pips and uh, trust in science. Have faith in science. Uh, science is God or something like that. I, uh, or maybe that's wrong. I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Aaron. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, and ad astra.